Well, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you all to this uh, forum event on uh, Vietnam, uh, past and future. This gathering has been made uh, possible by the support of uh, Vision EHESS, the Centre for History and Economics here in Cambridge and Cambridge University Press. So since its first publication in 19... Uh, 29, Anaus has fashioned itself into one of the most distinctive identities of any academic journal in the global humanities. It has achieved a global uh, prestige as a method, as a school, although this does not, I think, adequately convey the diverse range of its contributions to historical and social thought across time, period and discipline and to a global historical perspective. The position of Anal in the francophone world of scholarship is unquestioned, but in recent years a new editorial team have been seeking to take the journal in new directions, whilst remaining true to its remarkable intellectual legacy. The editors have since, 19, uh, since 2012 been committed to translating articles into English, and this project, this year, reaches a new point of departure, as Anals will now be co-published by EHESS and for the first time in an English language quarterly uh, edition, which will be published by Cambridge University Press. And the journal for the first time will be accepting uh, articles written in the English language. Uh, speaking as a, a member of the Academic Publishing Committee of the Press, I can testify to the excitement in the press about this uh, venture, and this is really exciting for Cambridge history and Cambridge humanities in general. And after this event, there'll be an opportunity to celebrate this new alliance uh, in the Press Bookshop, and we hope you'll all uh, join us. But this is also, I think, an opportunity through us, through this forum, to take stock of the Anal Past's achievements and possible future directions, not least. Uh, an opportunity to examine how far the rise or revival of transnational, meta-historical, long-duration studies might create new connections or convergence across Anglophone and Francophone historical traditions. So to this end, we're delighted to welcome speakers from the current editorial leadership of ANAL and commentators uh, from, from this parish. Um, so let me introduce, first of all, uh, uh, wearing the tie there, uh, Etienne <laughs> Anheim, uh, Director of Studies of the HESS, the editor of Anals, who has been steering this project. He's an intellectual and cultural historian of the Middle Ages and currently leading a major new project on the historical sociology of culture in the 12th to 16th centuries. Um, at the far end, uh, Stephen Sawyer, Associate Editor of the English Language, edition of Annals, chair of the history department at the American University in Paris, a prolific writer on urban and political history, state and statecraft in France and the United States uh, in the modern uh, era. And next to uh, Stephen, uh, Romain Bertrand from Sciences Po, Paris, uh, a historian of, of, of Southeast Asia, well known for his work on European and Asian encounters in the early modern era, but it's only driven back colonialism and colonial memory in a comparative perspective over the longest duration. Um, and also from uh, the Centre for History and Economics that shares with Anals a uh, commitment to uh, is interdisciplinary historical study, we have next to me Gary Stegman Jones, currently a Professor of the History of Ideas at Queen Mary London, but co-director of the Centre of History and Economics here in Cambridge. And I think it's fair to say his intellectual journey as a social and intellectual historian intersects with that of the Annals at various points, not least in his recent book, Karl, Mar Karl Marx, Greatness and Delusion. And uh, in the middle there, uh, Issa Hussein from Polis in this university, uh, a, a, a scholar of the history and politics of, of <coughs> Asia. Her recent book, The Politics of Islamic Law, Local Elites, Colonial Authority, and the Making of the Muslim States uh, advances the study of the global connection of ideas and societies in a way, I think, that Anas has also been working towards. Um, 
So I think what we'll do, we'll hear first from uh, the, the announced team, beginning with Etienne, and then, uh, and then Stephen, and then Romain, and then have some comment from Gareth and, and Issa. Uh, they'll speak briefly, because we want to leave as much time as possible for uh, open discussion uh, at, at the end. So to our guests, thank you so much for traveling to be with us today. It's an immense privilege to have you here, and we're really looking forward to these series of events. So, Etienne, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I begin because I've got the tie. That's <laughs> so I, I, I really want to thank Tim Harper and uh, Isaac Hussein and Gareth Stedman Jones, Daniel Pierce, too, and all of the Cambridge University team. And I, first, I, I want to say how happy we are to be here today. Because um, seven years ago, I was in Oxford to discuss uh, the Annal, their past and present, what makes sense in Oxford. Uh, but today, in Cambridge, we may go further and maybe talk about the future, too. And uh, the question for us is, what is a scholarly journal such as the Annal today and tomorrow? That is a question that we posed in Oxford and then in two editorials published in the journal uh, in 2011 and 2012. And it is the question that I would like to return to today as a sort of preliminary evaluation of the work, both intellectual and material, that has been accomplished over the last 10 years by my predecessor, Antoine Lilti, and myself, along with an editorial team that has profoundly changed over that time. After a period marked by debates about the crisis of historical and social sciences that began in the 1980s and lasted until at least the beginning of the, this century, debates that had a particular relevance for the annal paradigm, the time has come for us to try to answer that question. And this particular crisis does seem to be distinct from those that preceded it. In addition to the intellectual and also political and economic issues at hand, the technological tools for conducting research and disseminating information are also changing profoundly. Researchers must take stock of these technical changes just as they need to come to grips with the intellectual and institutional displacements that have occurred over the last decades. During this period, historians and more widely social scientists have worked consistently to redesign their questionnaire and methods in order to obtain new empirical results. And yet, the more technical changes have, to a large extent, been proclaimed rather discreetly because scholars have, for good reason, been careful to avoid the excesses of programmatic declarations and of turns. Nonetheless, a new phase of historiography is being written. The past 20 years have seen a re-articulation of knowledge and practice. Investigations emerging from postmodernism and the cultural turn in the human sciences have been largely digested. <laughs> New methods of analyzing action and data have been incorporated. The relation between the temporality of historical action and that of historical writing is being considered. The critique of sources has been transformed. Alongside the development of important exchanges between the various social sciences as well as philosophy or literature, and renewed investigations into the epistemology of history have been conducted emphasizing a new complementary between case studies and generalization. These vast inquiries demonstrate that the crisis of history has, to a great extent, been surmounted, and we hope that the Annal, among a lot of others, has directly contributed to this transformation, and overall, we continue to do so in the future. How will we achieve this, indeed? It is important not to separate a journal's intellectual ambition from its material form. And this is one of the essential lessons to be drawn from the sociology of texts and the material bibliography of Donald Mackenzie or Roger Chartier. And it is 
in precisely this perspective that we should consider our digital and linguistic policy as well as our new partnership with Cambridge University Press, which Steve Sawyer will come back to. But it is also the sense <coughs> in which we should understand a number of propositions put forward by the journal in recent years, constructed from concrete examples rather than under abstract theoretical banners. For example, this was what drove us to discuss, <laughs> among a lot of other people, the history manifesto published by David Armitage and Joe Gouldy. Most of the contributions collected around this book were critical, but together they opened up an international <coughs> space for reflection on history, its role, and its place in the social sciences. One that takes seriously not only the circulation of knowledge and historical paradigms, but also the anchoring of different perspectives, in particular national, <coughs> historiographical, and also political traditions. We tried to do the same, for example, with Thomas Piketty's recent book, Capital and the 21st Century, in another issue. This is a central question for the Annals tradition. Is economics still a social science that is a historical science in the full sense of the term? The answer is by no means evident for the disciplines have evolved and diverged over the past decades. Economics has placed <coughs> an ever increasing importance on pure theoretical models. Conversely, history and the social sciences have gradually come to consider economics as a separate and unfamiliar field. Confronted with this twofold illusion, the uh, annals have consistently pursued their project to create a space for intellectual and scientific dialogue between the social sciences, beginning with history, <coughs> economics, and sociology. Furthermore, by placing the issue of inequality at the center of the debate, Piketty also provides us an, an opportunity to re-engage with the old but essential question of the nature of capitalism. Indeed, indeed, if the problem of inequality lies at the heart of our modern societies, this is not always true of social sciences, particularly economics. Affording it a central place is thus not only a way of advancing our scientific knowledge of modern capitalism and its historical foundation. It is also a way of reminding ourselves of the political vocation of the social sciences, which are simultaneously a product of their era and reflexive tools of knowledge and action. It is no accident, we think, that the original project of the Annal emerged during the violent crisis of the 1930s. A journal such as our own has never aimed to participate in the structuring of society by formulating directly applicable solutions to its problems. Rather, we have always sought to use the tools of history and the social sciences to help societies understand themselves and the impact of their political and institutional choices in a clearer light. In return, this more profound comprehension of the present world contributes to developing the breadth and scope of the social sciences and their methodologies. And so, in a broader sense, the new place given to a dialogue with for example, philosophy or with literature, demonstrated in special issues published in 2009 and 2010, or with intellectual history in general more widely, is not evidence of a movement away from the original project of the journal. Indeed, the Annal have rarely published as much research on economic or social history as they do at the moment. Rather, it is evidence that this project is being expanded and deepened by uh, historiographical and epistemological reflection on the very nature of the historical knowledge at work in empirical research. And this approach is emblematic of a perspective that may be termed 
genealogical, as it aims <coughs> to uncover the links that bind historians to their objects of study through the history of the transmission of discourses, academic or otherwise, relating to them. <coughs> Scientific investigation is not simply, as you know, the result of the confrontation of a given documentation treated with the necessary resources of erudition with the theoretical or methodological questioning of the researchers. And for example, if the notion of status, as we hypothesized in a special issue devoted to the topic of status in 2013, uh, as the notion is particularly pertinent today, it is because it is emblematic of this reflexivity that underscores the limits of the opposition between the categories of historical actors and those of researchers, the question of emic and ethic. The notion of status is central to history of the social sciences because it is central to their historical heritage. And without the philosophers of antiquity, without medieval clerics and jurists of the ancien regime, status would not have the same meaning for social scientists today nor would it have the same analytical capacity. This is not to say that scientific objects are not constructed, but rather that this construction also has a history that is slow and complex, <coughs> nourished by autonomous scientific ambition, but also by beliefs, representation, and inherited descriptions. This reflection reminds us that a renewed social history does not constitute a subfield of historical reality that might be opposed to others such as economic, political, or cultural history. It is nourished by a wide variety of tools and methods, from the critical use of documents to epistemology, from the study of concepts across long periods of times, along the lines of a reflexive history of science, to the mobilization of resources drawn from anthropology economics, political science, and the sociology of action or domination. Without a doubt, this social history is different from the one pursued at its supposed zenith in the post-war period, when the term designated both a domain of study and a method of research. The separation between the two, which contributed to a parallel separation of militant political positions from epistemological engagement, <coughs> no doubt explains a certain nostalgia. But in abandoning a reified conception of the social, social history today and tomorrow recaptures the essential ambition of the 1930s, the pursuit of a general historical sociology that explores all forms of documentation and can relate to the whole range of questions posed by historians. This is a resonance that one must listen for in the word social, which is <coughs> the word social, which does not so much designate an object as a problem. And the, the attempt to solve this problem is precisely what makes historical science a social science and what continues to make the anal the anal. Indeed, a journal is not a mere act of validating of papers. It is an intellectual and material project. This does not mean that we should establish imperatives, launch new intellectual trends, or defend a sectarian vision <coughs> of historiography. More than anything else, we seek to put our principle to work, to publish texts that link the empirical work of the historical and social sciences to methodological propositions, to open the journal to a wider world of international scholarly production by enlarging its geographical and chronological horizons as much as possible. To pursue history as a social science inscribed within the multidisciplinary project of the human sciences and to give scholarly research a reflexive and critical dimension indispensable for avoiding the dual trap of positivism and relativism. It is only by thinking about his or her own historicity that a historian or a historian
can fully live up to this ambition vis-a-vis -vis his objects of study. For even if he or she is not always aware of it, they too have played a part in fashioning him or her as a scholar. For the Annal to continue as a journal today and in the future, <coughs> uh, it must be a whole lot more. It must establish at once a practice, a process of writing, procedures, and an approach to debate and distribution. In short, it should aim to elaborate not a doctrine, a dogma, but maybe a style in every sense of the term. And it, it is true that this already sounds like a kind of editorial, historiographical, and political program. But it is a program that has to be constantly a work in progress. Thank you very much. And thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Ed. Thank you very much indeed. So we'll hear a bit from Stephen. Thank you, Tim. And uh, the, the panel past and future, and thank you for making us present today. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> Uh, and I'd also like to take this opportunity to say thank you to, to Daniel Pierce, uh, somewhere in the back, uh, <laughs> and to his team for everything they've done to make this possible. Um, so I suppose I should begin with the obvious, but certainly not inconsequential observation that as far as I know, the Annals, History and Social Sciences, is presently the only historical journal of its scope, prestige, and longevity to produce a fully bilingual edition. This simple fact emerged out of and raises a few obvious questions. Some of these questions were posed by the Annals editorial team as the project was being launched, and some have emerged over the last five years, since 2012, uh, as we began the project. I'd like to briefly touch on some of these questions because I think they offer perspective on why or what were some of the motivations for creating the Eng English language edition, but also the issues such a project raises for the shape of historical scholarship in the days to come, decades to come. The shifts in the production of historical and social scientific scholarship, and in particular, obviously, of online publishing over the last two decades, has been lost on no one. Across the first years of the 21st century, the Annals confronted these problems in ways that were, of course, similar to other journals <coughs> of its caliber, such as open access, the creation of a website, supplementary materials, et cetera. But there were also ways in which this transformation posed itself differently from other historical journals and historical communities across the world. First, the question of publishing online was perhaps peculiar for the Annals because of its storied history as being coupled with such a recognizable historical school. <coughs> the Annal school has largely been perceived, at the very least, as a coherent historiographical approach and project, both inside and outside France. The historical works of the successive generations of the editors of the journal, along with histories of the Annals and its founding members, and even historiography seminars and undergraduate and graduate programs across the world, uh, have contributed to its renown. This also had the effect of projecting a certain methodological consistency and thematic coherency that Etienne was referring to earlier. The Annals is certainly not alone here. Such purported coherency has been true for other schools, perhaps under in these walls we could quite simply refer to the Cambridge School as well. But in the case of the Annals, this supposed coherency was coupled by a journal which had, at least for some, been perceived as the scholarly vehicle or at the very least, the center of gravity of this school. <coughs> Whether or not the Annals ever was as coherent as the designation of a school suggests, the tremendous opportunities afforded by the global distribution of historical knowledge, both online and in print, has raised questions of the impact of things like keyword searches and other tools of online publishing and what that could mean for a potentially coherent editorial project. How was it possible for the journal to evolve then while still maintaining its identity to, in order to pursue some project or to continue this project without becoming stuck? Certainly by the early 2000s, there was a self-conscious cultivation of the diversity of those working inside the journal and the articles published within it. 
So the response to this new state of the art on the part of the editorial board was not to attempt to force some necessarily artificial methodological or other coherence, <laughs> what Etienne was just referring to. To the contrary, the ambition was to look for new ways of cultivating the journal's distinctness and diversity amidst the major changes taking place in scholarly production, as well as, of course, France's place in that production. The English edition provided an ideal vehicle for responding to these changes while also continuing the, well, frankly speaking, boldness that had traditionally characterized the journal since its founding. This is certainly not to impose some sort of linear development from Marc Bloch to the creation of an English version. To the contrary, it is to embrace the contingency inherent in the unforeseen changes taking place in historical scholarship and the variety of potential responses. As was stated in the editorial published in the first issue of 2011, the English edition was no doubt the most ambitious and undoubtedly the most imperative undertaking in the attempt to confront this new historical and historiographical situation. The demands of translating every article, either into English when received in French or from any number of languages into French and English, were apparent from the outset. But of course, it struck the editorial board as essential to the journal and its goal to maintain an international research profile, to at once publish international authors and to continue to be read abroad. Of course, as we are all abundantly aware, the politics of the internationalization of the historical and social scientific community, from hiring to promotion to publishing and funding, are also being tossed about by crosswinds. France is certainly no exception. And in part because of the politics of language that France is in some cases known for, there was, unsurprisingly, the risk that such decision be taken as a sign of submission to the current predominance of the English language. Of course, the ambition was quite to the contrary. An ambition reflected in the decision with Cambridge University Press to couple the French and English editions. The aim was quite clearly to acknowledge the predominance of English in the distribution of historical knowledge and social scientific knowledge more broadly in order to continue supporting francophone research in the social sciences. The challenge of supporting national historiographical communities amidst the growing opportunities but also challenges of an emergent, though still infantile when compared to other social sciences, global historiographical community is lost on no one in this room. And it must be remembered that the subtitle of the journal His Histoire et Sciences Sociales indicates that history and the social sciences are, are its main focus. But it is also an established fact that French researchers who want to be read not only in the United States, of course, but it also in China, Brazil, or Germany, to name but a few, now need to publish in English, which has become the language of choice in the international scientific community. We recognize that no doubt this will become an even stronger requirement in the future. But there is another issue at play. For all the opportunities inherent in the globalization of historical scholarship, the medium and model for such diffusion is not evident. Broadly speaking, beyond the real scholarly importance of book-length projects for advancing historical knowledge, the historical monograph also remains the dominant mode for such banal, though inevitable, elements of scholarly life as institutional and professional development. At the same time, however, the cost of translating books for the distribution of academic history remains a challenge. The result of this is not just financial. It is, in fact, deeply tied to the construction of historiographical and scientific communities that remain structured around national and linguistic, and I would suggest it's in that order, boundaries at the same time that extraordinary opportunities to speak across these same boundaries increasingly exist technologically. Of course, there are plenty of historians who have transcended national boundaries and have an impact on national historiographies beyond their own through the translation of their books. But the translation of books pales in comparison to the vast exchange of scholarly production that could potentially take place through the international circulation of articles. So while scholarly and institutional motives continue to place an emphasis on the monograph, the potential for a greater internationalization of historical knowledge sits largely in the dissemination of translated articles. The consequence of this are twofold. First, 
it raises the question of how it would be possible to build more deeply integrated transnational historiographical communities while recognizing the fundamental role that national and linguistic boundaries are playing and will continue to play in the institutional structuring of knowledge. An English and French version of the Annals is thus an attempt to reconcile the demands of scientific evaluation, the need for in-depth <coughs> assessment of the material being published, with the need for risk-taking, which has always been the mark of the Annals and of any ambitious editorial project. <coughs> the publication of a translated edition of the Annals is an attempt to respond to these challenges by serving as a site where historians from across the world who are published in two, uh, in two languages, thus simultaneously preserving a key contribution to a storied and vibrant institutional context of which it is a part, while more directly contributing to an international for the leading journals devoted to the social sciences, bilingual publication should provide the opportunity for writers to work in their native languages while simultaneously benefiting from the distribution and international visibility for which a translation allows. Second, and at the same time, the facility of online production has made it increasingly easy to distribute knowledge, but it has also raised the stakes of scientific validation. And from this perspective, an international because bilingual journal is part of the Annals search to remain open to new ways of writing history, new mediums, new methods, while at the same time recognizing that journals have an important role to play in validating the quality of historical and social scientific production on a global scale. The Annals English edition is thus of particular importance and faces specific challenges because it is a generalist journal at a time when hyper-specialization reigns. One of the distinctive characteristics of the journal is its chronological and territorial depth. The journal has always published on areas and periods that have little to do with France or even European history. Thus, while the areas covered by the journal are as wide as possible, the outlets for the internationalization of research have not necessarily kept pace. Outside the United States and Europe, the relative neglect of the historiographical dynam dynamism of countries such as India, China, Russia, and Japan, in addition to those of Latin America, the Middle East, and Africa, is as remarkable as it is problematic. This raises the question of how it would be possible to contribute to increasingly international historiographical communities, which are at the very least familiar, familiar with the methodological assumptions and secondary literature of other national or regional contexts. It is, possible to build a for is it possible to build a forum in which Middle Eastern scholars of African history or Latin American scholars of East Asia or even U.S. historians of the U.S., not to mention Russian social scientists who are experts of the Caucasus, publish alongside one another in a journal produced in France? If it is, and we hope to contribute at the very least to this process, then what does this mean for international historiographical communities and for the structuring of historical and social scientific scholarship in France and beyond. These are just some of the implications of producing a bilingual version of the Annals. The English version thus plays a central role in our objective to establish bridges between media, languages, current editorial work, and a rich historiographical heritage so that the journal might be used in new ways. The risks at the outset were numerous, but this step in the process the signing of this partnership with Cambridge and the opportunity to work with a press of its size, experience, expertise, and reach into the global scholarly community is a tremendous opportunity and cause for <coughs> encouragement. With this new stage, we have left the initial risks behind, new challenges await, but the English and French editions of the Annals will, we hope, continue a tradition of exploration and ambition that has marked the journal since its founding and thus a new chapter in the annals shaping of a historica, historiographical horizon. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Stephen. And remember, sure, we'll yep. take us to these further horizons. Uh -huh. <laughs> I will try to do that. Mm -hmm. um, well, obviously, trying to account for the way the annals did engage or did cope with uh, what is now mostly labeled as global history. Um, actually, it's a very tricky business. And, and 
I will only provide you with a very sketchy overview of what the review has uh, experienced in that subfield in, uh, in the past decades. It's a very tricky business because one runs the risk of positing the review as having played a kind of pioneering role in the advent of global history. There is always that temptation uh, when you revisit, you know, in the, in the long run, the story of uh, a review uh, to think that a, it has played a dominant or a pioneering uh, role. But of course, uh, prior to the 1970s, there is no such thing as global history, at least as we understand it uh, today. And all along the 1980s and 1990s, what goes under that name is not a clearly delineated field <coughs> of study, but rather a maze of distinct and sometimes conflicting research endeavors. And one has to keep in mind that the institutionalization of global history uh, is actually a pretty recent development, at least on European soil, whether it still includes the UK is a question. <laughs> <coughs> it was written before. You know, <laughs> Um, for instance, the European Network in Universal and Global History was founded in 2002 only, while the Journal of Global History, which is also published by uh, CUP, was launched no sooner than 2006. And even if the uh, Journal of World History is, is more ancient, it dates back to the early 1990s, then we see a process of the institutionalization of the field of global history that is pretty recent. Yet what one can find in the annals, starting by the early 1950s, is an always greater attention paid to extra-European historical settings, something that is akin to a process of enlargement of the historian's geographical cool anthropological horizons. So this process has a history of its own, and I think it's closely linked to Fernand Brodel's art project of creating a new institutional space acting as a meeting ground, not just between history and the social sciences, which is very much still part of the agenda, but also between people working on Europe and those dealing with extra-European societies. Indeed, at the same time that uh, Brodel was struggling to create and uh, further develop what is now the École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales, <coughs> the sixth section of the École Pratique des Hautes Études, born in 1947, he became utterly interested in importing in France the American Area Studies Center uh, model. And thanks to a generous grant of the uh, Rockefeller Foundation, <coughs> he traveled widely across the US in 1955, and that's very interesting, you can read the reports that he wrote <coughs> in this uh, his trip uh, from one campus to, to, to the other in the US. And that's where he discovered this model of the Aurea Studies Centers and the way they were articulated both to uh, faculties and to larger communities of uh, specialists of extra-European uh, uh, situations. And this model was to become the basic pattern for his own project of uh, Maison des Sciences de l'Homme. At the very same time, by the late 1950s, Lucien Fed creates, under the aegis of the UNESCO, a collection titled Cahier d'Histoire Mondiale, whose aim is not just, and I'm quoting from the uh, uh, opening statement uh, by uh, Fed, it's not just to fill the gaps in our knowledge of non-Western societies, but also to account for the slow and painful creation of Europe in the cultural sense of that word. So you see the founding favors uh, had a pronounced interest in extra-European histories, or rather, to stay tuned to the way the then phrased it, an interest in non-Western societies. Pierre Chonu, of course, plays an instrumental role in this enlargement of the geographical scope of French history and of the annals, <coughs> while he's already working in Spain's archives in order to craft his global economic history of the Spanish Empire, Chonu writes many reviews of books dealing with the Spanish Americas and also with uh, Portuguese Latin American settlements uh, for the Annals. And that's really where, uh, in, in the corpus <coughs> of uh, book reviews, you see an upsurge in the number of extra European settings that are being given due attention. Therefore, there is a kind of defining moment in the history of the review's engagement with the world, uh, meaning the world minus Europe. And I think that it came for very different scientific, tactical, and uh, generational reasons. 
uh, after all, I mean, uh, Brodel and Cholu are part of the new generation at this time, by the uh, <laughs> 1950s. Yeah, you have to imagine uh, that they were young guys, angry young men at the time. And they embraced the promise and prospect of a new kind of world history. This has as much to do with scientific purposes or sheer scientific curiosity as with disciplinary struggles. And in the case of Brodel, it's also deeply linked to uh, his will to emulate what is then seen as an efficient model for the institutional reordering of public funded social science research, namely the US Area Studies uh, model. Then there is a second important moment, so I go very quickly. By the late 1960s, early 1970s, the question of the often tense relationships between social history, social history writ large, and uh, structural anthropology leads to a renewed interest in extra-European settings. These are the heydays of historical anthropology, especially of the kind practiced by Nathan Vachtel. And in a famous 1971 special issue of the Review, featuring articles by Claude Lévi-Strauss, Maurice Godelier, Dan Sperber, Emmanuel Leroy Ladurie, and Jacques Le Goff, André Burger pleads for, for a détente in the Cold War between history and structural anthropology. So you see that at this point, the interest in extra-European settings and situations is part of this kind of uh, war between disciplines that uh, is at the very heart of the historical anthropology project pursued by the review all along the 1970s. So where do we stand today? <coughs> so, mm, well, in a sense, I think a biblical statement uh, would perfectly apply to the way the, the review envisions its positioning with regard to a number of global history related debates. So really a biblical statement, John 14, 2. <laughs> <laughs> My father's house has many rooms. <laughs> <coughs> Since the early 1990s, the review actually has been host to very diverse historiographical proposals. For instance, it has welcomed articles stemming from a renovated, non-diffusionist history of science, such as those published, among others, by Simon Schaffer, Antonella Romano, and Catherine Jamy. It has also extensively published papers dealing with long-distance trade networks and situation of multicultural commercial trade contacts. For instance, those written by Etienne de la Vessière, Gilles Avar, and Francesca Trivellato. In 2001, a special issue titled History on a Global Scale, featuring articles by Sanjay Subramanian, Serge Gruzinski, Roy Bean Wong, and Roger Chartier, did put under scrutiny the theoretical agenda and the methodological tools of connected history. And indeed, it, it is one of the first public appearances or editorial appearances of that very notion of connected history. So the special 2001 issue, I think, was also very important. And the review still accommodates distinct ways of articulating European history and area studies. For instance, there also exists a vibrant tradition of comparative uh, history, which is partly the legacy of another of the founding fathers, uh, namely Mark Bloch. One could refer here to uh, articles <coughs> published by the mid-80s by Roy Bin Wong and Geoffrey Lloyd, for instance, in the review. Connections, comparisons, circulations, the review welcomes different, sometimes overlapping, sometimes uh, overtly conflicting analytical uh, models. I would say that in the near future, very near future, <laughs> while the review will of course keep playing its pivotal role of an eco chamber for emerging research agendas, it will also pay particular attention to the question of how to productively reconcile micro history with global history. <coughs> especially since the question of how to do social or intellectual history on a large scale and in a long durée perspective has recently turned into a heated debate. And you already made reference to uh, the debate surrounding the publication of David Armitage and Joe Gildy's History Manifesto. And actually the review published in 2015 a set of critical answers uh, to that uh, manifesto in its first version. So this is also a way uh, <laughs> to advertise a soon-to-be-published special issue on global microhistory <laughs> by the mm -hmm. So you see, uh, the, the only thing that we can say as, uh, uh, well, as with regard to the uh, 
the way the review has tried to engage with uh, global history related uh, issues is that indeed uh, there are many rooms, but in the end there is a, a single house. Thank you. Thank you, Roman. Thank you very much. Um, we'll have some comments first uh, from, from the panel and then open it up, but I'd, I'd, I'd like uh, Gareth Edmund to, to start. Well, very, <coughs> very briefly, um, obviously I want to congratulate both CUP and Diennale on this amazing uh, project of um, making a global history uh, in a biling bilingual sense. So that means it's open to all sorts of historians who previously would only have heard indirectly some of the schemes that uh, Anal was, was doing. Um, I'm very impressed too what you've been doing the last 10 years and not just the, the website, but having uh, public debates around issues which seem to me quite distant from what was the, from the sorts of things that were happening uh, uh, in the early 60s or 70s in, in the Nile, where it was a, a very different place, as far as I can remember. Um, if I could just have a brief moment of autobiography, um, I uh, was lucky to have be inspired by a French teacher at school. Uh, so after that I went to Paris and uh, when I went to Oxford I carried on uh, being very interested in, in, in French uh, writing and, and particularly French history. Um, and it ended up in when I took my final in a 1964, uh, a long uh, interchange. In those days you had a viva every time uh, when you did your degree, a long exchange with Trevor Roper um, who found it hard to believe someone might have come across the Annal. Uh, we talked about Porchnev and um, about Goubert and 17th century <coughs> peasant revolt and so on. I think in the end he was convinced that I had actually read some of this <laughs> stuff, which uh, he initially thought <coughs> maybe I was just putting it on. Um, I had a, um, an exchange with the Annal uh, later, towards the end of the 90s, um, when it was under a, a new regime. Um, sadly, um, it was the um, um, Bernard Le Petit um, period when he was trying to renew uh, Annal. Um, and they produced a, a, a book called Les Formes de l'Experience, um, uh, which they tried to have a new model rather than the sort of Durkheim Simeon sort of uh, uh, approach. Uh, uh, earlier on, and they had long critiques of, of Dure and, and Montalité, which had been the catchwords, I think, of, of an earlier Annal generation. Um, and although I thought they did make some very interesting changes, uh, it seemed to me to be going in the direction so fierce was the sort of feeling about not being structuralist anymore, that they were going in the sense of what I call at the time a boneless history um, of conventions and idiolects and situational um, semantics and so on. Um, well, all I can say about that is that um, looking at what's happened since, um, Anal has, has terrifically changed, I think, in the, right, in the right direction. And if there is a crisis now in, in um, the sciences, it's in... Uh, economics and sociology. I don't think it's in history. I think history is actually <coughs> the place um, which we can turn to. It's like when the, you may not know in France, when the Queen came to the LSE in 2009 and said, well, did you expect this economic crisis? And they almost said, crisis, what crisis? <laughs> um, whereas the historians, I think, and certainly at our centre here, uh, were fully aware we... Um, we, well, because what we tried to do was to link um, um, the development of the history of ideas, political thought, um, as it had been developed in particularly in Cambridge, but not exclusively so, to apply that to economic ideas. Um, and uh, Emma Rothschild's economic sentiments would be a very good example of the sort of thing we were trying to do to connect uh, discourse um, and uh, history and to produce uh, an interchange with, with between economists and 
historians, which we still try to do. Economists are quite sort of uh, reluctant participants some, sometimes, but uh, there are good e economists who, who um, are working with us. And I think that's a sort of model, too, about what we can do with the annal. Um, the question of a global history, I mean, is something which obviously its time has come, and annal is the absolutely ideal place to do it. And what we shall do, I think, in Cambridge, the lucky luck here in Cambridge University Press, is encourage our students to publish with you on these global themes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> Lisa, thank you. Lisa. Thank you. Um, Tim mentioned the parish of Cambridge, and I see myself very much as being first, first villain in line for questions. Um, so um, mostly what I'd like to do is just talk a little bit about um, problematics of encounter in the making of knowledge, firstly to the gains and losses in the work of translation into which I'd like to raise the perhaps unexpected specter of Inoki the wrestler, and second, cho choices about temporal and spatial scale into which the slightly less surprising specter of Brodel, but Brodel the prisoner of war. So first, to Inoki the wrestler. Many of you, Roman in particular, may remember the wonderful story that Sanjay Subramaniam tells in his 2005 article on uh, incommensurability about Antonio Inoki, the Japanese wrestler. In 1976, he has two famous matches, one in Tokyo against Muhammad Ali, and the other in Karachi against Akram Dehalvan, a member of a celebrated Pakistani fighting family. Subramaniam describes the encounter with Muhammad Ali in Tokyo as lasting 15 long rounds, described mm. perhaps as the most boring match of the century. The two fighters came from different sports, and the problem was essentially one of producing a set of rules that would suit both and essentially compromise neither. Eventually, a draw. Ali was rumored to have been hospitalized briefly for damage to his legs. There was a lot of kicking. While Inoki <laughs> gained much in terms of publicity, but was saddled with huge debt. <laughs> Subramaniam goes on to describe how, in part because of these debts, Inoki goes on to fight Akram Pahalvan in Karachi, where instead of 15 rounds of deadlock, what resulted was a humiliation. In a minute and five seconds, Inoki had managed to put an arm lock on Akram and then broke his arm. Using this as a metaphor for imperial encounter, <laughs> <laughs> Subramanian's target, yes. <laughs> very important, Subramanian's target is the utility, or rather the lack thereof, of the concept of cultural incommensurability, and to suggest in its place that we look towards the ways in which what looks like encounter has long been about learning by doing, about, I quote, approximation, improvisation, and eventually a shift in the relative positions of all concerned. It seems to me that this metaphor also has something to say about disciplined encounters, or the discipline of encounter, and the often invisible labor that makes them work, that allows them to be more, again, as Sanjay puts it, I quote, a boring draw or a chicken wing arm lock with disastrous consequences. <laughs> Traditions of knowledge making are like pugilistic regimes. Their rituals of deference and contest, their lineages, their networks of e economic and institutional underwriting, their relationships to particular audiences and cultural complexes, their status as emblems of imperial power. So we are here we stand at a moment of great opportunity for Francophone and Anglophone scholars who have long been working and learning from each other but also for students and scholars newly able to access annals in KL as well as in Hanoi, in Johannesburg as well as in Port Louis. What would be required to make that access real and significant? As we think about traditions of knowledge and their making, how might we make explicit our disciplining mechanisms and understandings going forward? Could the politics of technological access and communication further exacerbate the likelihood of boring drawns and chicken wing arm locks? Can technology facilitate productive encounter? Can technology offer us better tools for theorizing encounter, connection, and whatever their antonyms might be? 
What kinds of translations would be needed for new varieties of disciplined encounters amongst new actors and fields to work? And how might long-established mechanisms of reciprocity and recognition be turned towards further interrogating the capacity and exclusions of the global, the international, and the regional? So from Inoki the wrestler to a different problematic of encounter that has to do with the future we seem now to face and the ways in which analytic scale has revealed itself in history as well as in the social sciences to be deeply implicated in present politics. Briefly, to remember Brodel, the prisoner of war. After he was taken captive by the Germans in 1940, Bordel spent 1942 to 1945 in a prisoner of war camp near Lubeck on the Baltic Sea. And it is in that camp that he writes what becomes the Mediterranean. This is a quote from him. It was in captivity that I wrote that enormous work, sending school copybook after school copybook to Lucien Febvre. Only my memory permitted this tour de force. Had it not been for my imprisonment, I would surely have written a much different book and my vision of history took on its definitive form without my being entirely aware of it, partly as a direct intellectual response to a spectacle, the Mediterranean, and partly as a direct existential response to the tragic times I was passing through. All those occurrences which poured in upon us from the radio, I had to outdistance, reject, deny them. Down with occurrences, especially vexing ones. I had to believe that history, destiny, was written at a much more profound level. Choosing a long time scale to observe from was choosing the position of God the Father himself as a refuge. That's Brodeau. The lesson for me is about the need for continued and critical reflexivity about the politics of scale, but now also to considerations of scale as praxis and our inclinations towards particular scales as praxeological choices particularly fraught and important now because the vexing occurrences with which we must live, of course, but because some of these occurrences are underwritten by the pow powerful political valence of the categories of ordinary people, common people, the non-elite, of common knowledge, and of new contrasts being drawn between <coughs> the, those who can or must move and those who can or must stay. I'm not sure any publication or set of interlocutors and colleagues are better placed to seek out methodological, pedagogical, and empirical answers to these questions, but perhaps part of Brodel's legacy may be to impel us to consider anew the relationship between the vexing occurrences and the refuges from which we must write. Thank you. Sure, our visitors would want to respond to what's been said, but I think let's immediately sort of open it up to the floor, and then, as we respond to questions from the floor, perhaps in, engage with what's been said from the from the panel. So, please. Rich. Thank you so much for a wonderful discussion. <coughs> Excuse my voice. <coughs> um, thank you, Cecilia, for bringing up the question of translation, which I was actually thinking about as the rest of what you're speaking. Um, but so to go on biblical metaphors, um, I want to ask Stephen a little bit about translation, some more logistical questions about um, the editorial decisions that are going to go into what does make the transition to English and what does make the transition to French, whether it, it is a vision that there's a one-to-one -one mapping um, that, that is, you know, that, that, is that the ultimate aspiration or is there some kind of editorial drive that's going to make that selection possible. And then the kind of related question, I guess, to do with the labor economics. I mean, where is this labor for translation going to come from? Come from? How is it, is it going to be incentivized from scholars or from um, professional translators? How do you maintain um, standards of academic quality if you make the latter decision? Yeah. So Wonderful. Thank you for asking. And I, this is an opportunity to Where's Chloe? The, 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 uh, she is our uh, one person uh, show, and uh, she, she's sort of. Um, uh, the, I suppose 
There, there are a couple of parts to, to what you're asking. I mean, in terms of the, the question of a sort of one-to-one -one, uh, translation, I think there, there are obvious issues that come up, and we've had some roundtables recently about this, uh, that, that sort of come up in any translation uh, uh, discussion about whether or not you can translate dispositif and, you know, etc. Uh, to my mind, that's less interesting. Uh, what, what I do find interesting is the question of trans, of sort of cultural translation of historical community, of historiographical communities. And the way in which um, a, a historian writing from, uh, is, is, may have a tremendous depth in their own national or linguistic uh, secondary literature, that when it arrives at the annals, strikes the board as you know, lacking, to say the least, for the very simple reason that it may be that there is a tremendous tradition of that in the French secondary literature, and the, or in Spanish or in Italian that, the, that somebody knows quite well. And when you decide that you're going to start to do a bilingual edition, and the idea is to attract <coughs> scholars who have been participating in a given national historiographical context, those issues become profound and, and essential. And all the way down to the very way that you use uh, that citation practices. And uh, we had uh, you know, the question of who one feels they must cite on a given subject, right? And we know that these things are subject to uh, all kinds of uh, influences. So, so I think that that question is, is very important and it comes up quite often. And there, again, the question of style is, is, is fundamental as well. So I think that's one part of it. Um, in terms of the financial aspect and the remunerative aspect of it, so to be completely, uh, uh, you know, I could tell you the rate that we pay. Uh, I think mean, it's 21 euros a fee. Uh, uh, but, um, and uh, it is a mix of translators and uh, sort of motivated scholars, scholars that are interested in, in doing that. Uh, there is then a process where, uh, a relatively elaborate process actually, where uh, Chloé goes through the translations uh, in, in, in an extraordinarily fine-combed way. It then goes to either uh, one of our colleagues on the board, Nicolas Barrère, who's also at the École des études financières sociales, or myself, and then usually there's an exchange that takes place after that. So there are at least uh, three readers after, and there is more post-production usually uh, Chloe, you could give us the exact figures, how long you give somebody for a translation and how long it takes us to get through it. But I would, ours is a little bit longer, it's a little bit longer on our end than the translation end, right? Um, yeah. Yes, but you work on a whole edition at one time, so just having somebody on the back of the team to write about it, I think it's different. Yeah. So it's, um, it's, so, and it's odd because there is actually, uh, there are a whole set of issues that emerge when you are trying to deal with that, with, with that sort of level of rereading of a text that's, uh, um, because of course translation is not, a, is not about perfection, right? That's not how <laughs> So uh, I don't know, does that answer your, your question? Yeah, I just wanted to say a bit about how you yeah. manage the yeah. work. So and then sort of, there are about, you know, at any given moment, about 10 translators that we're working with. We have to say that it's a very complicated process and it's a very complicated project and we are working on for seven years. And uh, uh, so now, because the first time we, we, we made public this idea was uh, when I was remaining with this session in Oxford uh, in, in 2010. And so after two years, we had the fundings and with the support of the Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique and with the Gould Foundation in France to begin the production uh, in 2012. And it took us five years until today to, to, to stabilize the, 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 the procedures. And uh, so um, we finally are here today with uh, this background. And, uh, 
maybe Chloe and Stephen could go uh, uh, further on, on the because it's, it, it's a very interesting experience from a reflexive social science point of view because we uh, every time we have to think about the translation or in French or in English and we have to uh, underline too that we receive a lot of papers in Italian and some in Spanish and German and um, we, we, uh, uh, we discuss the paper in the original language and after that we ask uh, the author to give us or a French or uh, uh, an English version. So the, the, the question of language is very complicated and we, we try to do our best but uh, our, <laughs> our editorial team, we, we have uh, Chloe Morgan and Séverine Guitton responsible for the French version and the, the English version and, and it's, it, it's a, a real big deal and that's uh, why today we're very happy to have the, the support of Cambridge University Press because we really hope that we can go uh, uh, much further in this direction. Um, how do we go about ensuring that this sort of moment then opens up uh, other readings um, outside Europe uh, amongst other linguistic communities? So is it the case that bilingualism then opens up multilingualism mm. uh, in turn? Um, and how, maybe it's you should ask this actually as well, um, how we can sort of proceed down that route so that we continue um, allowing an engagement between European historiographical communities uh, and non european given the diversification of language that this project represents. Um, and another thing that I was wondering about was, I guess, fits, fits with another field which is really burgeoning at the moment, um, which intersects in complicated ways with social history, which is environmental history. Um, and I wondered where that would fit within the remit of your project, given that it's such a growing field of such critical importance uh, to our present moment. <laughs> well, first of all, once again, it's not the story of a face-to-face -face problematic encounter between uh, the English-speaking academic world and the French-speaking academic world, um, if only for the reason that each and every uh, situation of contact is much more complicated than that. And in that case, as uh, Etienne has just uh, reminded us, uh, we receive, we read, and we review a number of articles written um, mostly in Spanish and Italian, uh, sometimes in, in German. So we, we have members in the editorial uh, board who are able to do that. Um, and this also means that we are able to, uh, uh, in a sense, judge the, these articles uh, by the historiographical traditions they stem from. So, you know, uh, each time it's a complicated process, not just in translating you know, from one language to another, but to assess what it means on a given national historiographical stage and what would be the added value of precisely trying to uh, import it to another uh, European-wide uh, academic uh, uh, stage. Uh, as for the question of environmental history, we actually published a number of uh, papers related to that, um, and there will be more. Of course, because the Anthropocene thing, uh, for instance, in fact, will, will figure prominently. <laughs> uh, we, we, we had the, the project to publish the first issue with Cambridge University Press uh, on the, the question of Anthropocene. But in fact, it will be the second <laughs> because of all the production problems. But uh, there will be not a special issue, but uh, a dossier, an important dossier on the question of Anthropocene from uh, an historical, philosophical, and sociological point of view. And also with a paper, uh, Zalazevich and uh, his group from a geological, engaged with social sciences point of view. So we, we are trying to do uh, uh, this sort of thing. And uh, I, I think it was very important uh, uh, what Romain said before, uh, about this question of European history and, and cultural areas. 
but w we try to engage with all important issues as environmental history, as uh, the treatment of big data. Uh, we try to do everything together, but it's <laughs> quite difficult sometimes. Uh, and um, I, I come back uh, for a moment on the question of diffusion and uh, overall um, uh, non-European or American uh, uh, diffusion. And uh, that's precisely a point on which we really have to learn from Cambridge University Press. And we had uh, yesterday a wonderful meeting with uh, Ellen Appleyard, Daniel Pierce and the team and, and we discussed the, the first, the very first subscriptions uh, because we are waiting for subscribers with Cambridge for two, three months. And that was, for example, very interesting to see the increase of subscriptions in South Korea for example. Now, it's interesting because the Anar were not very famous in South Korea, I have to, s <laughs> to admit it, <laughs> and, and, and sadly. But uh, uh, I think that we are more than 40 subscriptions or something like that in South Korea for three months, and that's very interesting because uh, I think it's uh, institutional subscriptions. That, that's to say that maybe 40 universities in South Korea now have the idea to uh, give uh, the NR to, to read to their academic and, and scholars and their public. And that, that's exactly the point that we uh, <laughs> try to reach <laughs> in this project. One of the points <laughs> we try to reach. Mm. Do any of our panelists want to come in on that? Uh, James Raven. I don't think Raven should say much, but I was particularly interested in the first, in the first question, uh, question on Stephen's response, which you, know, you, you talked about the translation historiographical tradition. But I was also interested in the, anything about the sort of the, at the micro level of the actual translation process to what actually comes out of that and how that can actually be a dynamic process of, of actually recording the process. Uh, um, in some sort of personal sense, I came across when I was involved with the, 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 uh, the Grotte Chakis uh, correspondence and the difficulty in actually get, and, and the, the sheer difficulty of, of, the, of that the translation project. But then when asked to, to write something in uh, appreciation of Daniel Grosch, um, in, in, in the publication of that and in the, the sort of um, correspondence that, that, that came after it, after it the sheer difficulty, the, 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 what one might say, the dynamic difficulty translated particular terms sure. created a really, really interesting encounter in which we explored what we really meant by something. Yes. And it was astonishing, absolutely mm. astonishing that there had been a misunderstanding <coughs> and it was not just a, a, a bilingual misunderstanding, but it, it spread to a misunderstanding across some sure. other languages. <laughs> Even in <laughs> French, there are some problems to understand that. I like those specifics. It was about words, actually, actually, it was about jobbing work and what that actually meant. And it created a and none of, I, my knowledge of those now engages in a small sort of footnote, and it's there. The, what we've lost is what actually happened when we exchanged all of that, which was really, really very interesting. Mm. I thought, I thought one time I'd try to put it together, but I had to do that. So at that sort of yeah. small level, that, that, that minute level, there is something which really generates something. I mean, just a few, absolutely. No, I mean, and there are just a few <laughs> observations, I mean, and, and Chloe would have others, and, uh, but one there are sort of there is a way that that the annals puts together history and social sciences that is different from the other historical journals, <coughs> and the way it sits institutionally within the Ecole des Études Sciences Sociales, and the kind of sociology that is practiced in that particular school does tend to generate texts that are extraordinarily difficult to translate. And the best example, and I'm sure Chloe knows what's coming, was, uh, was an article by Amosi on, on the question of uh, the history of the, uh, essentially of the notion of the cattle, which doesn't exist in English. Uh, and it's not a manager, it's not this or that. And the problem was, it wasn't like 
the debates we had about dispositif. The problem is that he's doing a reflexive sociology of what this term that doesn't exist in English <laughs> means. <laughs> and it's the last paper of the issue uh, about status, yes. social status. Uh, yeah, exactly. So also. we, we asked uh, sociologists to, to give a reflexive perspective on the French <laughs> theoretical history of categories during the <laughs> last decades and that's why it's very complicated. <laughs> and, uh, and so that was one and the other was with the introduction that was written by Etienne and, uh, and Jean-Yves Jean Gagné. And uh, there it was very interesting because obviously in any discussion of status Max Weber is sort of in the background. But of course the way that Max Weber's notions of status made their way into American social science or uh, through largely through Talcott Parsons, as opposed to the way it came through uh, French social sciences. And the terms that people use to talk about that uh, are quite different. And again, and different again in the, in the British case. Or in the, uh, and so the initial translation that we had was just like, oh my gosh, this is, this is you know. Uh, and so trying to work through those, those questions. So there are traces of the, of the history of these terms or uh, their, their very existence. That's just two examples, but they were both, both of those were led to very rich discussions and some debates uh, about what we should do that may have been similar to what you've described and have not been reduced to a footnote. We do have some archives, right? Etienne has been very uh, exigent about maintaining archives on this project, so. But that's, that's a part of what I was underscoring uh, about the, the question of reflexivity of historian and social sciences, because I think this, a part of this project is very interesting, not only because of the archives for future historians or uh, intellectual historians, but it's very interesting for us to be more conscious of our own ba intellectual and linguistical background, as you said, with this example of uh, Roger Chartier and Daniel Roche. And very often, when we have a text uh, written by uh, uh, an Italian scholar or a Spanish scholar or French scholar, and we, when we go back to the original version with him, mm -hmm. Even in this, this case, uh, 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 there is a, a, a complicated process of uh, explanation because when you write in your own language, there are a lot of things that you don't you, you, you don't see, uh, right. and so uh, uh, no, it's it, it's a good experience in in this uh, way too, but it's <laughs> quite quite tough sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, uh, if I can ask a question. Um, uh, I suppose my broad question is, we've talked quite a lot as historians, which I think people here predominantly are, um, uh, and I think people will be familiar with the role of Annal, a very significant role of Annal in you know, bringing together disciplines, but perhaps thinking about it rather more in the sense of the, so the social sciences in their various forms being introduced to history and shaping history over the decades rather than the reverse. Um, and I was wondering how you might situate yourself in regard to you know, your speculative impact on the social sciences and the kind of reverse proposition. Um, and I partly wanted to um, open this up actually in thinking about some of the projects that Gareth mentioned earlier about the history of economic thought and trying to shape that in relationships with economics but also thinking about the way that, in some ways, the agenda so frequently has been set by disciplines outside of history, that historians then feel pleased with their multidisciplinarity by integrating. <laughs> but I'm not sure the message gets out in the other direction. And this seems to be a pattern, I mean, it might be a caricature, but you know, it still holds strongly today. So you've mentioned things like having an issue on Piketty um, or the Anthropocene. Of course, these are clearly tradition, or, or tradition is too strong, but you know, new um, areas of endeavor that are coming from outside history. So I suddenly see now a lot of works in economic history on inequality that are being written as if 
Piketty or indeed Tony Atkinson invented the problem as if this hasn't got an enormous historiography in the past. So really the boot is on the foot of the social sciences, kind of kicking history into action. And history is being seen in a very positive light by those people, but it's not really history as historians have practiced it in regard to those things. And one might say the same is true of, you know, the Anthropocene is seen to be making demands on history rather than the reverse. And so I wonder how you would in a sense, situate yourself against the set of propositions that I've, I've just given about the, sort of the, the direction of thought, but also given that, of course, the now ambition has always been to historicize the social sciences too. How would you think of the, the current incarnation of now and its reach into the social sciences and the influence it can exercise there? <laughs> I do not want to answer for everything because uh, <laughs> no, because of my time, I really regret it. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to hear from the man in the time. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's a deaf place. <laughs> no, uh, no, but it's it's a it's a very large uh, question and problem because. Um, as you said, we can see that a lot of uh, disciplines uh, are concerned by um, historical problems, but very often when they, uh, they try to figure out the question, they uh, figure out it uh, as uh, an historical term, but without historians very often, <laughs> if I, I, I do it shortly. Uh, now, when uh, I read that economic or uh, sociologists say history matters, yeah, uh, in fact, I say yes, because uh, <laughs> for two uh, <laughs> or one or two years, <laughs> history matters. Uh, and so uh, uh, I, uh, what we think is that uh, in, in both ways, uh, a journal is a good common place to build uh, such a discussion and that was uh, the idea uh, of this important issue around Piketty because uh, we asked to uh, economists, historians and even medievalists or uh, specialists of early modern um, sociologists to read the book, to discuss it with him and we published all papers with an answer of Piketty. And that was very interesting because in these debates that we organize uh, every three months at the National French uh, Library, the, the debate around Piketty was the biggest one because it is now very <coughs> famous. And we had, uh, I don't remember, 500 persons. Uh, usually we, we have 40 persons. <laughs> and, and no, because but that was our purpose because after the debate, it was very interesting to see that uh, economists that were there were a little bit more aware of what historians are trying to do. And in the other way, I think that sometimes historians are not completely uh, uh, aware, conscious, and, and interested by the theoretical work of his, uh, economists or sociologists. And uh, maybe sometimes uh, they, they, they think that uh, it's not worthy to, to, to read this kind of uh, secondary literature. And uh, we cannot uh, uh, do everything with one issue, but we, we try to do that on very specific uh, points of the, the, the theoretical uh, landscape. And we will try to find the good uh, uh, points uh, and, and to discuss things that can be generalized mm, in a larger way. Mm. I think it's, uh, I don't know if you, you agree with yeah, this, I mean this self-description. It's, it's quite difficult to, yeah. to, to answer. Um, well, on the one hand, we are here to, to welcome uh, what's happening. In the, in the larger field of uh, dialogue between history and the social sciences. Uh, this basically means that at some point when there is a, uh, uh, a film you know, making its way, we will receive papers or we will ask people precisely to, to come forward with 
a paper explaining what the debates surrounding the Anthropocene right now are really about. You know. And on the other hand, um, precisely because the Annals is a review with a history and, um, and a deep intellectual commitment, um, we also do with a legacy of our own, which basically means that um, uh, in, in a number of uh, ongoing debates, we also try to, uh, 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 to make uh, a certain tradition, historiographical tradition, uh, being heard. Uh, so for mm. instance, global history. I mean, if we try to do something about you know, reconciling micro history and global history, it's not just for the sake of trying to, uh, to defend once more uh, a certain kind of social history. It's precisely to try to engage with the kind of questions you were asking about, you know, uh, what to do in these new grand narratives, such as the ones you know, that people like uh, Armitage and Guldi are advocating us to, 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 to go to, uh, what to do with these people who are you know, forced to move or who don't have the freedom to move and so forth and so on. Uh, what micro history then can help us uh, 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 change a little bit in these emerging new grand narratives uh, is precisely to, to, to stay as close as possible to the people themselves to escape once again you know, the grips of large-scale entities of well-known <coughs> historical uh, characters and so forth and so on. Uh, that would be the same with uh, environmental history. We published, a, I think, a very important paper about the special turn by Angelo Torre, uh, which was once again building upon a forgotten legacy of microhistory, the work of Eduardo Grandi, uh, in order uh, to account for you know, uh, the way that social space and nature are always co-constructing uh, themselves. Um, so this is a way to say that we welcome what's already there or emerging in the field, but uh, we also have to do, I think, with, with our own legacy, uh, precisely to, to keep following, uh, I mean, the, uh, uh, it's not a word, or it's very, <laughs> um, but it's part of our legacy also. It's social history writ large, in the sense that it's not an history of the social, a reified you know, set of facts, or, uh, but it's rather a, a certain idea of, of history. Uh, and in this sense, as being very important also to the ongoing debates uh, in, in the larger field of the, of the social sciences. So we are at the crossroads, in a sense, you know. And we are well. And maybe I can add. Uh, I was just going to say, I mean, and there's also something that Homer said earlier when he spoke about Bastel and, and the sort of aggiornamento between anthropology and uh, historical anthropology and history, which is a sort of um, uh, a more uh, sort of one particular part of the larger question that you're asking. But. Um, the, the relationship between history and social sciences in the journal is, of course, a very complex one going back to the, the tensions between Baudel and, and Lévi-Strauss, the emergence of historical anthropology, and then the shift by Le Petit towards uh, uh, a new kind of pragmatic sociology. Uh, and so I think your question is, is excellent, but it beca precisely because it raises this issue of you know, which social sciences is sort of dominating the dialogue and, and how. Yeah, I just wanted to add uh, a thing about the question because it, um, this is not only a concern uh, for the dialogue between history and social science, but in the field of is it history itself, for example, uh, with the, the, the subfields in which erudition is very important. And one of the things we tried to do this uh, last 10 years, for example, is to uh, uh, publish uh, a lot of papers on ancient history. And the, the, the question of ancient history was uh, uh, quite important for us because um, it, it could quickly ancient history could disappear of this sort of mm -hmm. journal because mm -hmm. we do not receive uh, a lot of papers we have to ask for them and we, we published uh, um, a, a special issue on the ancient Greece uh, something on the economics of ancient Egypt mm -hmm. or uh, on Rome and th that's important too to think when we said uh, 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 
a large uh, geographical and chronological uh, 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 possession, uh, uh, it's important to, to think to, to these things. And I, if I go back to, you, to your presentation, when, when um, this tale of God's house and wrestlers and, and broken legs, <laughs> uh, uh, I think, no, the question of translation is very important, but it's not only linguistic, and you, you're right, it's also the question to, uh, is to translate topics and, and problems and uh, to, to, to build some common places for people interested in social sciences and history in general. Because uh, very often when you read someone working on something in sociology or in anthropology and uh, from a very special perspective, you recognize a lot of common material. You see that the same thing was also treated by someone in the German tradition or in the Italian tradition. <coughs> and all these things uh, sometimes uh, must be connected. And I think that the, the, the very uh, specific work of uh, such a general journal as the Annal is to try to connect these things mm -hmm. together. And, and in this sense, uh, we're like brokers, <laughs> but in the, s <laughs> in, in the sense of, uh, of Sanjay. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, oh, sorry. No, no. Just um, one of the questions I wanted to ask in relation to that is um, how you deal with um, the division between departments in France. Um, because in, in Britain, we don't, I mean, economic history and history, political history, they all go together, more or less. Um, uh, whereas in France, my memory at least was, unless it's changed a lot, is that the science sociale and history are put in very different places, um, or in the Sorbonne, in any way that they were. And so that political, there's still that sense in which um, event like history is thought of as being something we don't do. <laughs> and I just wonder whether that still persists as an anal type uh, attitude and whether the departmental divisions uh, e still encourage that to exist. But we have to deal, no, certainly we have to deal with these institutional uh, borders and, 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 and there are some difficulties uh, at a certain point. But uh, all institutions uh, of research and all universities are, are not divided in the same way, so uh, it depends a lot. Uh, and uh, all, uh, all the specialists of social sciences among anthropologists, sociologists or economists have not the same possession uh, uh, in front of the annals. And so we are trying to find uh, allies, <laughs> I would like to say, to, to build some bridges. <laughs> yeah, and in speci I mean, specifically, this goes back to something that was mentioned earlier. The anal, de, and, and specifically to what Romain said, which is that the development of the anal s follows, to some extent, the history of the École des études en sociales where the structuring of knowledge is very different than it is anywhere else. That is particularly in its relationship both to the university but also to the CNRS. Mm. That is the, the National Library for Research, the National mm. Research uh, Foundation. So, and so one of, that has always been part of the, the marker of it. Now, of course, sociology in France, is, as it is elsewhere, but perhaps particularly in France, has, has always been very divided. <laughs> and the OHSS has not always bridged those different schools in the same way. Uh, so, okay. yeah. Yes, please. I was uh, interested to know more about how a bilingual project like this would approach the quite significant differences between the literary tradition and writing style between English Completely, that uh, comes about when dealing with translations. Is it something that you're attempting to streamline a bit more or maintain that diversity? And how does that reflect on the profile of a bilingual uh, production? Actually, I, 
I'm sorry, I did not hear the question. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm just having. Oh, I was just wondering um, how the difference between uh, literary tradition and writing style between history, English written and French written Africa. history, mm. how that will play out, uh, especially when translating these things, yeah. Uh, yeah. going for more diversity, trying to streamline these things. <laughs> Uh, that's a very important question, and uh, <laughs> thank you very much because <laughs> really it's a, uh, it's a big problem. It's not the problem that we discovered with the bilingual version because we, we had already papers from the whole world, and there we have to deal with a certain diversity of uh, 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 narratives, and uh, and not only uh, in the English uh, uh, papers. There is something very special for yeah, there are the American papers, <laughs> which are uh, all <laughs> written in a sort of AHR style, and uh, <laughs> no, that's something quite special. Not all of them. Not all. <laughs> Make yourself <laughs> major. <laughs> yeah. And no, uh, uh, and for example, in Italy, there is another tradition, and when you see yeah. the, the great papers from uh, of uh, Carlo Ginzburg or this sort of stuff with these all these points uh, one mm -hmm. after the others and, and it's very uh, Italian way to write history so uh, sometimes uh, it's quite difficult for us because we have our own uh, habits and our own tradition and we try to understand what the person writing is trying to do but we uh, sometimes we disagree uh, among us now. Yeah, of course. Oh, maybe you can. Uh, and I think I mean there is, um, and I, I heard you also say something literally about the style of the writing, if I understood correctly as well. Is that uh, also what? You, and and that's certainly correct. And and the importance of not uh, um, reducing, you know, not creating this kind of bland, yeah. uh, Chloe has a, had a wonderful adjective, woolly, I thought that was, uh, woolly <laughs> translations. Uh, uh, I, th so, now, this is partly why the review process of the translation sometimes takes much longer than the actual translation itself. Um, I think the emergence of algorithmic translation is going to have another huge impact on this particular kind of production. And in that case, the kind of work that we're trying to do in post-translation post editing is going to be fundamental. Because uh, in creating an inter, increasingly international historiographical communities. Um, obviously, if we think self-reflexively, uh, as, as Etienne has been suggesting, the role of language and, the, uh, and of English in the social sciences and in history and in the natural sciences is completely different. And we, we obviously refuse the transparency of language, which, is, which has been a fundamental aspect of uh, an innocent version of, of, of the natural science uh, English production. Um, and so trying to figure out ways of maintaining that uh, for the time being, I think, I don't know if you disagree, Chloe, but I would say that it's largely taken the place of trying just to rereading and rereading the translations with the original text uh, again and again. And then I'll just say one last thing. I mean, there's obviously also the process which the annals um, I think is more sensitive to than some of the other journals of its caliber, especially uh, in the United States, the sort of numbers of revisions, the number of, you know, when you get into the eight, nine reviewers, um, uh, the eight, nine back and forth, the three year, four year process with certain journal. Um, it's, it's, it, it, it certainly is, is a process of disciplining that we've all, you know, What's that like? Taming. Yeah, yeah, yeah like taming of anything. And I think that uh, even, I mean, you know, without going into the, all the process of the, uh, of, of the vetting of the articles, both uh, with peer review and within the board itself, which are lead to uh, quite amazing discussions. But um, 
there is, I think, an attentiveness to that, which is not a part of what other sort of international journals are necessarily doing. And it has to do sort of uh, just, it's, it's a byproduct of the binational, not so, and this comes back to your question, it's a byproduct as opposed to something that's uh, always in the forefront of the uh, project. What we are trying not to do is to normalize, you say that? Norm yeah. Yeah, yeah, to normalize, to, to produce, uh, not to produce uh, annals, paper, template, uh, because we, we would like, we, we are very happy to discover and to give to our public uh, very different traditions of narratives and of writing. But it's quite difficult sometimes and, and we are trying to maintain uh, this diversity uh, with the French tradition, the Italian one, the German one the British or English one and, and the American one and some others. And for example, uh, uh, I, I remember we made a special issue on uh, the communism, uh, mm. on the everyday life uh, during the communism. And there uh, were two uh, Russian papers written by uh, actually uh, Russian scholars and they were written in a very special way. <laughs> yeah. No, special for us. Uh, uh, I mean, the, uh, I remember the, the uh, Igor Nasky's paper. Nasky, uh, yeah. that, that was something very strange for us. Uh, and we had a, a, a long discussion on the idea to publish the paper, to, to in revise or to, uh, uh, to stay with this sort of specificity and, and, and that was very interesting uh, and I think uh, uh, we, we, we found a solution <laughs> but uh, no it's it's very important and, and um, it's closely related to the role of our editorial board and we had last year I, I was uh, involved in a round table with an, a former editor of the American Historical Review and that was very interesting to see the difference uh, between their uh, process and ours. Because uh, in our process, there is a peer review uh, phase. But at the end, the, the, the final cut is every time uh, uh, made by the discussion every month of all the editorial board, which is something very common in other, mm -hmm. I think, in the British tradition. Whereas uh, now I understand and I understood this time uh, for the American Historical Review, that uh, a lot of the the process is completely devoted to the peer reviewers, and that the board never <coughs> met together uh, and never uh, w once a year, and they do not have a, an editorial discussion. All papers that were very uh, uh, positively reviewed are published without this sort of discussion. We, I have to say that sometimes we have papers v uh, with very uh, uh, good uh, reviewing that we, we decide not to publish because of our, our idea of what we are trying to do. Mm. And, and, and mm -hmm. so I think it's another difference on, on this very question. Thank you very much indeed. We are moving towards the celebration part of <laughs> the, 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 the evening, but I just wanted to give the whole panel, anybody, if, if anybody wants to, uh, a final word. Just one, you do. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure we have time for another question. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe just on that, that idea of the bilingual, once again, um, I mean, as like in, I'm not sure that everything that is being published currently in the UK or in the English-speaking world is akin to the classical style, you know, finely grained uh, British social history. Uh, that's the same in France. So there are very different uh, styles in, in the writing of history. Uh, this is becoming something of a reflexive concern to historians in France as elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And we are not here in the sense to either tame traditions of knowledge or to arbitrate between, you know, competing styles in, in the writing of, of history. Uh, we are just here to give due attention to the, to the issue uh, and, and to try to keep the, uh, um, uh, the, field, the linguistic field of what we can publish as open as possible. 
Uh, and so I just wanted to mention that for once we uh, recently we had a special issue dealing with uh, late medieval early modern Japan uh, and actually uh, so some of our colleagues uh, you know in the field of Japanese studies did translate a number of articles and uh, we had also uh, precisely to produce a text in order to locate historiographically speaking this set of Japanese colleagues text and this was a very interesting issue not just for the content of the articles but it was an, uh, a door to a whole different historiographical uh, universe and this I guess we, we will try to, to, to keep doing it. Uh. Mm. The same with the Russian papers I was yeah, talking Russian. about before because we had the, the help of our friends in the Russian history field. Thank you very much. That's a really good note to, to end on. I know there are other questions, but there will be opportunity as we move to the bookshop to uh, talk, talk, uh, talk more. And it strikes me that there's so many more conversations we could take forward. Cambridge history, like the Annals, is a house with many, many rooms. <laughs> there are <laughs> editors of a number of other journals here. And I think you know, the possibilities are, are hugely exciting at this crucial juncture for our common work. So thank you again thank you, uh, thank for you. coming thank you, and thank you, uh, thank you everybody. You